please take your Bibles, and I'm turning to Hebrews chapter 9, and I begin reading with verse 23 down to the end of the chapter. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own, otherwise he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly wait for him. This morning, I wish to present a message to you under the title, The Power of One. Now, lest there be any confusion, having seen that in the bulletin as you entered today, this is not a message on you can do it, nor is it you are mighty. Rather, the emphasis here, as in all of Scripture, is that our strength is so horribly limited and we are humbled when we are faced with our utter weakness. So the power of one is not a cheerleading chant in which you go out and say, I've got it, I can do it, I don't need anyone except me, myself, and I, here we go. Absolutely not. Hebrews has been teaching us repeatedly of our one great high priest in contrast to the great numbers of high priests who through centuries had come, done their work, and moved on to a grave. And we have heard of the one sacrifice he made for us, that great sacrifice on Calvary and that it was a one-time offering for all time. We are also shown that though there was a portable tabernacle in the wilderness, and later a glorious temple in Jerusalem, these were a copy and a shadow of the one true tabernacle in heaven, into which Christ entered to make propitiation for our sins. Where in all of that do you find human strength, human endeavor, human initiative, human accomplishment? It is absolutely missing. The one great high priest, of course, is Jesus Christ, who obediently came at the call of his heavenly Father to do what no one else had ever done, that one sacrifice which he did not make in conjunction with his disciples. His disciples scamper, and Jesus Christ is there, mighty to save he is standing there in all of his radiant gloriousness, and he is the one who steps forward 
to offer his own blood as the perfect offering. All of the lambs that had been sacrificed and offered in previous centuries, they had been scrutinized in order that they might be declared perfect, but yet they were imperfect in some way. And Jesus, he, that one, steps forward in order to make that one sacrifice for us. Certainly not of our own doing. And we are yet to hear, even as we have heard, the writer here laboring to push forward to us that this was something that happened once And because it was so powerful, because the effects were so earth-shaking, it never had to be repeated, nor shall it ever have to be repeated. And that those who do attempt are badly mistaken. And that one tabernacle in heaven, we consider it again today. One, God's work on our behalf and how powerful it is. The power of one. So what in the world am I talking about? I want to hold out to you the power of both our Savior and of his work, and I want to hold out to you the power of death. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, we begin, even as we have read, that we are picking up on an explanation that has been taking place through Hebrews chapter 9. We have been told of this one true tabernacle into which Christ has entered once, and that because of the power of that, that it is over and done with. And we pick it up with verse 23, therefore, and of course, you can't just read that in isolation, you've got to understand where it's building upon, but here it is, the blood that was shed for the cleansing and for the salvation of you and me. It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these That is, the tabernacle which Moses constructed. It was a copy of what Moses had seen as he went up to Mount Sinai and saw heaven open. The copy was to be cleansed with blood, but the heavenly things themselves with something better. No blood that ever went through a lamb or a ram or a bull or any other animal was sufficient in order that that temple, that tabernacle, would be cleansed. Something better had to be offered. For Christ, he did not enter a holy place made with hands. He had no business in the, tab- in the temple in Jerusalem, being of the tribe of Judah and not of the tribe of Levi. He did not enter that holy place made with hands because it was indeed a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself. And I want you to grab a hold of what comes next. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. There's a mouthful that is said in that phrase. Jesus Christ has done a great work for us. But when Jesus left his disciples, in John chapter 14, he says plainly that I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus declared that he was going to continue a work of preparation 
that all those who were trusting in him might have an eternal dwelling in his presence. But here also, we are shown that Christ, when he ascended into heaven, he did not go back to his heavenly Father and say, look, oh, I'm so glad that's done. The pain and the toil and all of that is behind me and now I can just put my feet up and be done with it. I, I did what you asked me to do. Jesus Christ and the love of God for us is shown in this, that he continues the work which was begun. He did not go home in order to put his feet up and to catch his breath after having expended himself in such a way, but rather he now appears in the presence of God for who? For us. For us. We are still ever constantly on his thoughts. The great burden and the desire of our loving Savior, our great elder brother, is that he would do a work on our behalf, interceding before the very throne of God, that we might grow, that we might be all that he would have us to be. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood. Go back in Hebrews if you've missed it. There was that repetition. And in the very repetition of the high priest year after year, it is shown that there was a weakness, there was a deficiency. But Christ... One sacrifice, and he sits down at the right hand of his heavenly Father, demonstrating that he was done. Verse 26, otherwise he would have need to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once, once, at the consummation of the ages he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Let's consider this. We're talking about the power of one. And we have been holding out Jesus Christ in his glorious power, that he has done what no one else could possibly even begin to do. He brought it all the way to completion and he sits down at the right hand of the Father. It's a demonstration of completion. How great, how mighty is our God that he would effect these things that love would be the driving force that would move him forward to see all of this happen. But let's consider another power that is at work in this world. If we go back to Genesis in chapters 1 and 2, we do not find death in the Garden of Eden until Adam and Eve took of the fruit which they were forbidden to eat of, and they ate it. And all of a sudden, their eyes are opened, and death starts its work, not only in them, but in all of creation. All of creation. Death is a mighty foe. Death is an ancient enemy. And he is strong. He is strong. Each and every one of us, for whatever other appointments or whatever other opportunities we may have in this world, here is one thing that we come to and we cannot miss it. First of all, grab a hold of that word appointed. It is 
appointed for men to die once. Over the past number of weeks and months, I've been curious that our country, which now has legalized doctor-assisted suicide, that there is such a clamor that we do all that we can to hold off the pandemic, and that measures have been taken in our day, such as perhaps none of us, except those who are approaching or more than 100 years of age, have ever experienced in the pandemic of the Spanish flu. Shops closed, schools radically altered, our whole lives, you need to be constantly thinking about what you can or cannot do. I'm amazed that there is such a clamor for life. I thought it wasn't a big deal. I thought that along with the legalization of marijuana, that brain cells weren't important and that life wasn't important either, that we could burn them off willy-nilly. However, is not the key that we want to be in control of ourselves, that we desperately want to be our own God, and that we don't want to have it appointed by anyone else the day of our passing, but we want to choose. However, Hebrews chapter 9 says it is appointed. Sometimes when I've had a dentist or a doctor's appointment or some other appointment of whatever kind, I haven't got the time that I would have preferred. There was one or two openings in the next many months, and it was sort of take it or leave it. Here an appointment has been put down in God's calendar that each of us shall die once and that after that comes judgment. Here is one of the biggest driving forces in evolutionary thought. Man does not want to be accountable Man absolutely is repulsed by the idea that there is someone who is going to call them to account for their actions, how they have lived their lives. You see, if we are from sludge, if we are basically grown-up germs, if we are nothing more than slime, then we are accountable to no one for how we live, and we can go about and do whatever we like. But if we are created in the image of God, everything changes. It is appointed for men to die once, once, and then comes judgment. Think of the power of death. Think of how mighty death is. We think back to Egypt and that night that the death angel passed through the land and the firstborn in every house where there was not the covering of blood, every house was touched. Think of the great and mighty men and women who have come across this world. Think of the accomplishments of this world. Think of the genius of the Michelangelos and the Leonardo da Vinci's way ahead of their time. Think of the political, the military conquests. Think of Alexander the Great after he had his last fight. The story is told that he sat down like a baby and wept because there were no more battles to fight. He had conquered all. And within a day or two, he was dead. Think of the grandeur of those who have walked this world, but death was greater 
than all. The power of one. And the one death that is appointed to each and every one of us. But that is not the end of the tale. We have verses 27 and 28 tagged and teamed together inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, we end on a cheerful note because our eyes are brought away from the power of death and brought back to our Savior, our great high priest. Christ also, having been offered one time to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. To those who eagerly wait for him. The book of Hebrews has been leading us through what Christ has done. But now there is that forward look to what Christ is doing and what he shall do, how that he shall come for us. As we had read for us out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul in like manner, he points us ahead and he shows us that there will be a great day when we shall stand before our Heavenly Father and that this world will be no more. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What Jesus promised his disciples in John chapter 14. For indeed, in this house, in this tabernacle, in this body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. And then verse 10 also, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The question comes, are we looking and is our confidence in Christ? Or is Christ the terror that we look to when we appear before him? If Christ is our high priest, then there is no terror in coming before him and of meeting him on that great day. Paul says we must all Every last one of us, even as we all pass through death and then comes judgment, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And Paul says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the terror of what it is to be on the wrong side, knowing what a horrible thing it would be to be separated with the goats rather than with the sheep on Christ's right hand. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, he says, we persuade men, we plead with them, we beckon them to come and to be right with God. Paul then talks in verse 14, the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, 
but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul says the love of Christ controls us. 33 years ago, Charlene and I at this time of year were making our way from Canada to Liberia in West Africa, there to spend about 14 months serving in the capital city of Monrovia. I was very interested there to learn that the crest of the nation had on it a picture of a ship returning with freed, liberated slaves to establish themselves in Monrovia, Liberia, and other places. And the motto on that crest was, the love of liberty brought us here. The love of liberty brought us here. Well, the love of Christ, just as the love of liberty for those so many years ago was something that impelled them and moved them toward a goal. Here also for us, the love of Christ, it's something that takes a hold of us and controls us and moves us forward that we might tell, that we might show forth the power of the one, the one, who died for us, that we might live not to ourselves, but to his praise and glory. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for how great, how mighty you are. And Lord, we would exalt and we would ever, even as we shall in heaven, we, we would want to lift up the glorious name of Jesus Christ. So Lord, work in our hearts and draw us to yourself and may we look for that great day when you will come once again. How we long, O oh God, for that glad day. So work among us and may we be the ones who speak forth your praises and may we indeed share with others of this great one who has come that death might be completely undone and that we might live, truly live for all eternity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.